monde, c'est nous. From uh, December 13 to 15, uh, 2022, heads of states and leaders from across uh, Africa will converge in Washington, D.C. Uh, within the context of the United States uh, Africa Leaders Summit hosted by President of the United States of America, Joseph uh, Biden. Organizers of the summit say it aims to serve uh, the, as a demonstration to the Biden administration's commitment to the African continent and uh, provide a forum for new uh, e joint initiatives uh, between the United state and countries in Africa. According to uh, uh, senior White House officials, approximately 50 heads of state and senior government officials from African countries are expected to attend the summit. Uh, the summit will discuss pressing global issues such as democracy and governance, security, trade and investment development, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, climate change, and the negative effect of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It will also include new initiatives to increase uh, U.S. engagement with the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, as well as initiatives to boost the continent's recovery from COVID-19, borsa food security, and promote investment in infrastructure, health, and renewable energy uh, uh, projects, among other priorities. The forum will also include interactions with the civil society, multilateral uh, meetings between President Biden and African heads of state, secretary uh, and cabinet level meetings for trade, energy and diplomacy, and a collection of industry-focused meetings under the purview of the U.S.-Africa Business Forum. The Biden administration is also expected to reiterate uh, the need for African governments to uh, address democracy and human rights uh, concerns. Uh, it is worth uh, noting that uh, the uh, first U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit uh, was held in 2014 under President Obama's administration, announcing and engaging uh, new private sector commitments to invest and uh, partner with African countries on initiatives in energy, financial services, climate change, food security, and health care, among other areas. This year's summit is expected to prioritize similar issues while placing an even greater emphasis on bilateral trade and investment initiatives. Uh, how then has this uh, U.S.-Africa summit uh, benefited the continent and continues to benefit the continent? Stay with us. This is Views on the Continent. <laughs> It is always a pleasure to know you're watching Africa Media. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us on this last edition for the week of uh, Views on the Continent, where we discuss issues that are pertaining to the continent. Uh, and today, our focus is on the upcoming U.S.-Africa Summit, a summit that has been taking place uh, since 2000. And uh, 14, when uh, President Barack, uh, Barack Obama was still president of the United States of America. And from December 13 to uh, uh, 15, uh, the heads of state uh, from the different African countries would converge in uh, Washington, D.C., United States of America, to uh, uh, discuss uh, issues that are of interest uh, to uh, the United States and the continent at uh, large. Uh, so today, our focus is on how this uh, partnership uh, between the United States and Africa has benefited the continent so far. What are the gains that have been made? Uh, what are some of the things that uh, uh, this, uh, this partnership between the United States and Africa has uh, uh, done for the continent, has helped in the growth of the continent or otherwise? So that's what we shall be discussing this day on the continent. And there are quite a good number of things that this uh, uh, that have been spurred out that will be discussed uh, during this uh, three-day event uh, that uh, comes up from December 13 to 15 in Washington, uh, D.C. For those of you who are joining us for the very first time, uh, this is an interactive uh, program where
way, you can always call and tell us what you think about this topic or any other issue that is of interest uh, to the continent at this point in time. Uh, but before then, uh, uh, we are uh, joining us uh, on the program this day. Uh, of course, uh, it is a program where we get a resource persons to enlighten us more about uh, what uh, the topic of the day is talking about and uh, how we can find uh, possible solutions to these issues being faced by the continent. And, and uh, today uh, we have uh, the... Uh, a privilege of uh, welcoming Mr. Elijah Enoakua. He is a researcher with uh, Leeds University on the African uh, Development. Hello, sir, and thanks for joining us on the program this day. Sir, thanks for having me. It's uh, a beautiful day today here, and I hope it's a beautiful day in Africa. Hopefully, we can have a, a resourceful discussion today about this meeting that's happening between the African president and the U.S. president, Joe Biden, which has been long overdue. So it's going to be a great discussion. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on the program and now where we are here to look at uh, the U.S. Uh, Africa <coughs> Summit. This is a summit that has been holding on uh, uh, from 2014. I think it was an initiative of President Barack Obama. Uh, 2014, uh, you, uh, African heads of state have been uh, meeting with uh, officials of the United States to discuss uh, trade and other uh, issues. So when you take a look at uh, this uh, partnership uh, between the United States in Africa uh, from uh, 2014 to now. How, what is your appreciation of uh, this uh, partnership? It gets a C grade. And I'll explain to you why I say this partnership gets a C grade. Um, Africa, we are dealing about close to $3 trillion economy. That's an African economy in approximation. That's the economy we're dealing with here. So the United States is not dealing with some From an economic perspective, they are not dealing with some wiggling, power in quote. Africa <clears throat> has everything that it takes from a partnership perspective for the United States to benefit. But if you look at what has been happening geopolitically, it's as if the United States has taken a back seat on, in terms of its African agenda. And they've given so much priority, I would say without any doubt, um, justifiably for what is happening in Ukraine. But what this did is they dropped the ball along the line. In doing so, they have shot themselves to the foot. I'm hoping that uh, President Joe Biden, you know, this is a reawakening for him to say, look, it's true that we have a lot of issues going on in Ukraine and the world is, you know, trying to see how they can solve that problem between Ukraine and Russia. Africa should not be put at the back burner at the back burner because of that. African issues should still be at the forefront of whatever international development agenda that the United States has, because Africa has always been there for the United States in many ways, shape and form. So the United States cannot take a back seat to African affairs. So I think it is a reawakening that President Joe Biden recognizes the potential of this continent. On a second path, Laurentia, I'm speaking now to my fellow countrymen, Africans. This is where we come to the table as a kingmaker. Because what is Africa should be asking themselves back home is these are leaders are going to the United States. They're going to be in Washington, D.C. with the president. Do they actually have an agenda of what they can present coordinately to the president and said, these are the things that we want. I know, you know, you've read that four-point agenda or five-point agenda that the United States want to talk about. But do they those issues align with what the African <clears throat> with what the African president has as the agenda? They talk about fostering economic agenda, uh, engagement, advancement in peace, which is something that everybody uh, would say it's uh, concerning in Africa. Reinforcement commit commitment to democracy. Yeah, so. Africans are looking up to their leaders to go there with an agenda that meet the aspiration of the people back home. The United States come to the table with its own interest. Africa should go to the table with its own interest. Africa should not be there to rubber stamp the interest of the United States in these conferences because the United States, it's a gigantic economy. They have their own interest. 
Nothing wrong with that. Every country has its own interest. So as you're going to the table, African leaders should have as a plan, a coordinated plan, since it's a coordinated plan, uh, summit. Because so far, I've been looking for communicates on this come summit to see if some of them are going to be having a one-on-one -on -one bilateral meeting with uh, President Joe Biden. I haven't come across one. They might be out there. <clears throat> but so far, there's no one-on-one -on -one bilateral meeting that's going to be going on. So it's a coordinated joint effort between the United States and African heads of state. What is the platform on which African heads of state are going in for? A has security as it's concerned. B has economic issues. B, the, D has uh, foot insecurity. D, but so what is that common platform on which all of them can present and say, this is our bottom line, Mr. President. If you want to work with us as Africans as a whole, number one, two, three, four, five. So that is the expectation that a lot of civil society Africans out here are looking for. At the end of the day, the communicator that's going to come out. Does it meet the aspirations of the African people? Or do I just there to represent you know, Robert Tan? Robert Stamp, uh, uh, um, United States interest. Not only that, as I said before, geopolitically, things have changed since the last time that they came to Washington, D.C. We've seen what's happening in Russia, <clears throat> I mean, in Ukraine, and we've seen the strategic position of Russia in Africa. So African leaders should be very careful. If the United States is simply bringing them to uh, Washington, D.C. to counteract Russian influence on the continent, or are they actually coming out? with an agenda that is going to meet the aspiration of the people. Because we all know that the position of the West, not just the United States, even um, Europe, is threatened in Africa as we speak because of the presence of Russia and the influence of Russia. And a lot of people, Africans have aspirations, and they have the right to take the, their own destiny to their own hands. You have to come to the table and say, we are an alternative. The West is an alternative. United States is an alternative. France is an alternative. UK is an alternative. I think if you want to deal with Russia, we can offer an alternative that is more probable, that is more economical, that is better than what Russia is offering. But standing aside and say, no, we want to fight Russia, Russia is doing this in Ukraine, and therefore uh, I dictate it to Africans and say, you cannot deal with Russia, you cannot do, do with this, it's not going to fly in the face of Africans anymore. Come to the table what you think you have, Come to the table what you think you can offer as an alternative to the African issues, and then that council will negotiate with you, discuss with you. They always say there are no permanent friends, but permanent interests. So Africans, if you bring something to the table that's going to be much better than what Russia is bringing to the table for Africans right now, of course, African president will be obliged to look at it as an alternative. But simply bringing them to Washington to dictate to them and say, you cannot deal with Russia, you cannot deal with China, you cannot deal with this, it's not going to fly. So that is the expectation that we're expecting out of this conference. Elijah, now when you look at uh, the different hearts of states of the continent, uh, you mentioned earlier on that if they're going there, they should have an agenda, they should have something that they are going there for, not for the, the, the sake of the summit but they should actually have an objective as to why they are going to attend that summit when you take a look at the uh, current african leaders we have uh, do you think they really have something concrete that they are going to present to uh, the uh, table during the summit in uh, washington dc on december 13 to 15. laurentia and my fellow africans we can only speak on what we see as communiques in the press and tv and uh, news um, uh, organizations and press conferences. So far, based on what we have been watching and trying to hear from the African heads of state, we haven't heard anything on what they are going to present. We haven't heard it, except it's somewhere flying in the cupboards of their mm -hmm. presidency that nobody has come over the, you know, in the media to present to the whole African community and say, we are coming to Washington. This is what we are going to present on the table to President Joe Biden as partners and what we are going to, uh, what the expectation is going to be at the end of the day. We haven't heard that. So again, this is an advice and, and a proposal to the African leaders. It's not yet late. Come out with a communique and say, as Africans, our needs might be different, but we all have common goals. Common goals of economy, what is that economic goal? Common goal of security, what is that security goal? Common goal of strengthening our environment, what is that goal? Common goal of 
food insecurity or oh, trying to see how we can have food security what is that common goal responding to climate change that is affecting disproportionately affecting africans meanwhile africans are not the one causing the whole issue what is that common goal we haven't heard that uh, Laurentia. we're expecting we're expecting that maybe at the end of the uh, of the conference africans head of states they can come out with a preamble or communicate to say we had this because so far we haven't heard it. We don't know what their platform is. We don't know what their agenda is. Are they just going to Washington to listen to Joe Biden speak on what his own goals are? Because what he presented here to me sounds like the United States agenda for the conference. What is the African heads of states agenda for this conference? What do they intend to achieve from the conference? We haven't heard it. Again, not to prejudge them, let's hope and wait and see what the communique is going to be after the conference, then we can make a decision and say, maybe they went to Washington to have fun time, or maybe they went to Washington to actually do something or not. So right now, it's premature to judge them. But so far, based on what we have heard and seen, we haven't seen any common agenda on which they want to work on. All right. Now, uh, when you take a look at the summit, we know we, we are, today we are focused more on the U.S.-Africa summit, but we have uh, other such summits that uh, take place uh, almost on a yearly basis. We have the TICAT, we have uh, the uh, China-Africa summit, and so on. And usually at the end of the day, you, when you hear the conclusions from such summits, you hear the other <laughs> partner has pledged the sum of money to support the continent. You will never hear that uh, Africa did this or Africa at the end of the summit. Africa, this was Africa's stance on the summit. Don't you think that is problematic? And how can this be tackled? Laurentia, like I said from the beginning, there are no permanent friends or permanent enemies. You only have permanent interest. If African leaders understand this, which I think they understand, they do have economic advisors, they do have political advisors, and these people are smart. So I have no doubt to to, to, to doubt that they do not understand, they do understand this principle. But the question that we're asking ourselves is, when they are going for these conferences, right? You know, the China-Africa summit, China, I mean, uh, Russia-Africa summit, and without going to the politics of it, of one country gathering a whole continent to speak to them, you know, there's some polemics behind that, but let's not go into that. Let's just talk about principle right now. Let's just imagine that these people have an agenda and by the time that they finish and that sum of money is being disbursed. Because if you look at the China African summit and you look at uh, Russia African summit that took place, these are competitive interests. Interests. And in, I'm talking in relation to the United States. The United States is trying to contain Russia in the world. We all know that. The United States is trying to contain China in the world. We all know that. Behind all these conferences, Rensha, I will tell you the secret, secret agenda that's happening. These are geopolitical positioning that is happening, and then Africa should not be used as a guinea pig for those geopolitical positioning. Africa should rather make themselves to be the kingmaker. That is the point we're trying to make. These two parties are fighting. Yes, Africa is not at that position to say we are a superpower to go toe to toe there. But we have our own interest. And if they want to come to us as Africans to say, okay, you have your interest, I have my interest, but I have a competitor who is the United States. The United States is not shy to the whole world to tell the whole world that China is the competitor. They're not shy. President Joe Biden has said it openly that China is the competitor. And they've said they're going to compete with China fairly and openly. But they will use anybody along the way for that competition. And Africa should not be the guinea pig. That is the point we are trying to make to African leaders. We shouldn't be the guinea pig that is sacrificed on the altar of the competition between the United States and China or United States and Russia. We should rather be the kingmakers. Right. And say, so, okay, if you want to deal with us, this is our platform. And number one issue is, I'm not dictated to them, but I can tell you, food insecurity in Africa. Problems of uh, war and uh, political insecurity in Africa and education, these three things. It doesn't matter which part of Africa you're coming from. I think we had this discussion on this platform. That in Africa, whether you're coming from Botswana, 
that is, you know, one of the most well-developed countries in Africa, mm -hmm. or you're coming from Chad or Djibouti, or you're coming from where, we have a problem of food insecurity. We have problem of insecurity itself. Mm -hmm. And then we have a problem of education. These are the three that you'll find in almost every country in Africa. The rest can come in on order. So why they go to Washington to have these conferences? Can they not put together a common agenda platform and say, regardless of our little differences of what we want to achieve, these are our number one issue. If you want to work with us, work with us on these three. This gigantic potential in all of Africa when it comes to agriculture, food security, that Africa can build on that and become a potential partner. We are talking about Ukraine today. The negotiation that went on between Russia and Ukraine was to do what? To allow them to export, to export their grains. The negotiation of that seaport that was blocked. Because Ukraine is a potential gigantic uh, producer of those cereals all over the world. So that is their number one interest. Even as they are fighting war, they are negotiating to get their grain outside. Because that's their interest. Yes, we'll fight the war, but please, let's not touch this aspect of our economy because you're going to kill us. And Russia had to bow. That is what you know that a country has an interest and the number one interest is what is going to protect. What is Africa's number one interest that they're going to protect whether in Washington? That is what we are seeing. Whether it is Russia, whether it is the United States, whether it is um, China, Nothing wrong in having those conferences, even though, as I said from the beginning, the polemics of it about gathering heads of state from the whole continent to go and talk to one single oh, country okay. by itself is problematic. But let's not go there. Let's go about partnership. So Africa should have those interests at hand that it can present on the table so that when you are signing an accord on a single platform here, Rohingya, we are talking about a single platform because. This is not a Cameroon United States conference. This is not a South African United States conference. This is Africa. Therefore, they need to have a common platform on which to work with the rest of the world, whether it is United States, China, and so on. So again, when these conferences are done and they sign that communicate, you will do, you have that message that transcends boundaries in Africa that can be easily implemented and Africa is going to come out from the We want to be in a position where Africa with more than 30% of world's arable land and cultivable land is talking about food insecurity. Africa is supposed to be exporting food to the rest of the world. So let Africa build on their strength and not on their weaknesses. Build on your strength, not on your weaknesses. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah. If you're just joining us, this is Views on the Continent, and we're talking about uh, the upcoming uh, U.S.-Africa summit that is going to run from December 13 to 15 in the United States of America. So uh, today uh, we are trying to uh, uh, discuss or find out how this uh, summit has benefited the continent so far, how beneficial has it been to the continent, and how does it continue to benefit the continent. This is a summit uh, that uh, started in 2000 and uh, 14 and now uh, we would like to find out from you what you think about the u.s africa summit is it a forum uh, where uh, the united states uh, assembles african leaders to tell them what to do or is it a forum where there is uh, an exchange of ideas an exchange of partnerships an equal exchange of ideas and partnership where africa can bring what it has and put on the table and tell the united states that this is where we stand this is what we want and this is where we want to get to or oh, what do you think uh, that's what we'd like to hear from you so our numbers are open our lines are uh, our lines are open our numbers are on the screen you can always call us and tell us what you think about uh, today's uh, topic also this program is streaming live on facebook so you can visit our facebook uh, page uh, drop a comment and tell us what you think about uh, today's topic uh, about the u.s africa summit uh, now let's come back to you uh, mr elijah now this uh, summit one of the themes uh, the key themes of this summit is going to be uh, on uh, uh, governance and uh, democracy 
and uh, in, in, in some of uh, the communiques or in some of uh, the uh, reports that uh, are circulating on uh, the media, we uh, learned that some countries, especially these countries where coups have taken place of late in Africa, they were not invited to uh, the uh, summit. Uh, so how would you uh, analyze uh, the United States' uh, presence or it's, uh, how it has been influential in trying to solve some of these uh, uh, security issues on the continent? How involved has the United States uh, been in the continent over the years? Maureen said the United States is a gigantic country with interest. When they talk about democracy, they are talking about Western democracy. And they have their own interest why they want to implement that democracy. I have said on this platform and many other platforms where I've been chanced to speak is that I, I am a proponent of democracy, but I am not a proponent, proponent of democracy at the level of the battle of the gun. Let me repeat myself. I am a proponent of democracy, but I am not a proponent of democracy based on Western ideology and Western agenda. That I am not a proponent of that kind of democracy. The kind of democracy that they went and killed Gaddafi and installed chaos in Libya. I am not a fan of that democracy. The kind of democracy that they want to bring down Paul Kagame because they believe that he's been there for 25 years. And when he goes out, what happens? Chaos, war, poverty, problems, anarchy all over the place. I am not a fan of that democracy. The kind of democracy where they're going to allow France to rule and impute their own ideology, assimilation on the people of Mali, on the people of Burkina Faso, on the whole of West Africa. I am not a fan of that kind of democracy. Yes, Africans need democracy on their own terms. On their own terms. Because what you see happening in Mali, let me tell you something. What you see happening in Mali and happening in Burkina Faso and back, happening in Chad, the people are saying we are tired of being dictated leaders. Not because Africa is allergic to democracy. No. Right. Africa is not allergic to democracy. Malians are not allergic to democracy. Burkina Faso, Burkina Bays are not allergic to democracy. Chadians are not allergic to democracy. These people are simply angry because the kind of democracy that is being installed or fall down their necks is puppet democracy. Installing leaders that are going to be answerable to Western people, Western leaders. That is the kind of democracy that Africans do not want. And I do not want that kind of democracy. So whether they invite Mali or they don't invite Mali, whether they invite Burkina Faso or they don't invite Burkina Faso, whether they invite whosoever or they don't invite, doesn't really matter at this time. All that matters is, do you want representative democracy or you want puppet democracy? Africans say no to puppet democracy. They want democracy of people who represent their ideals. It's not that Malian want junta and military rulership. No. The same with Burkina Faso. No. All they are angry about is the kind of democracy we have is democracy that is installed from, right from the West to fulfill the interests of Western powers. That is their problem. I hope the West can listen to this message and pay attention including my brothers down south in the United States. Because when you want to fight Russia in the United in Africa, you have to pay attention to the idea, the aspirations of Africans. It's not because they just sat down one day and got up from bed and said, no, we don't want France, we don't want the West anymore, we want Russia. No, they have gone through experiences that shown them that their interests were not being taken care of. Their interests were not at heart. It was Western interests that were being that were being implemented or being carried out in their countries. Therefore, they said, like what the Frenchman said, "Roll the ball." They were angry and said, "Done with the West. Done with whoever is coming from the West and saying democracy. We want something else." That is what is manifesting in these countries. It's not a manifestation for uh, or law for a military junta. It's a manifestation for real representative democracy. Let the West take note of this. So whether you invite them or not, and even those who invite, I want to send a message to the West. I live here in the West. <clears throat> Africans do not hate the West. 
<clears throat> Africans do not have any problem with the United States or, or, or France or EU. If you want to deal with Africans, at this present dispensation in the 21st century, you have to know that you are dealing with a different generation of Africans. Even those leaders that are there in Africa, it is, I mean, uh, in, in, in Washington, D.C., it is just a matter of time. If they do not represent the people, I'm afraid, Mr. Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, I am afraid that those people will follow this the example of Mali and Burkina Faso. If they are not representing the interests of the people, if they are there to represent some other interest, it will just be a matter of time before you see the people to ri rise up. So to answer your question vividly, it doesn't matter that they have not invited those leaders. Those that are invited, what kind of democracy do they actually represent? That's the question they should be asking themselves. And as I said, it's just a matter of time. Those ones might follow the route of uh, Mali or Burkina Faso or whosoever. So they should better be careful what, when they talk about democracy because Africans are watching and they're watching very keenly. Of course, of course, uh, Africans are watching very keenly. And now, uh, to, still to, uh, uh, we're still uh, looking at these countries uh, that have not been invited to uh, the summit. And all that has been going on in the countries we have, uh, Sudan, Mali, and a host of others. Uh, how, ever since uh, coups uh, took place in these countries, uh, how do you think the United States has, has intervened in one way or the other? Or how have they tried to show uh, their role or played uh, their role as a partner of the continent? Or is it that when they have such summits, they only sideline such countries for not uh, following the kind of democracy they want? Unfortunately, Laurentia, the United States have not played a very good role. I expected of them in this conflict. We saw the United States try to lecture African leaders when it came to the case of uh, Russia and Russia. Ukraine and say, oh, African leaders, they are being that standing on the sidelines. I wish they knew what was happening. I said, Africa does not have its own history. Africa has a history of dealing with the West. They know exactly what they're doing. They have been beaten and they have taken their time. They said, once beaten, twice shy. Africa was taken to the World War to fight a war that they never took, they never started. They were taken into the Second World War to fight a war that they never started. Africa has been involved in a lot of wars and issues where they are just fighting a problem that was caused by somebody else. But this time around, the people are saying, hey, wait a minute. This problem is between Russia and Ukraine. We can be asked to take uh, a position. But the United States made a mistake. I think they corrected themselves some time ago. They made a mistake of trying to lecture but some of them came back to smooth those statements and say, we are not actually lecturing Africans. We think we should give them time to take their own positions on these issues. And it is the approach that should have been taken long ago and said, we know that Africans have their own ideals. Africans have their own agenda. Let them, you know, we, you might suggest to them that, well, you think Russia is doing wrong which Africans understand. They are not morons. They know what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. But allow them to take their own position. Don't push African countries and say, you must take the side of Ukraine. Because we've seen that Africans have been beaten down for so, much, so long, and they're like, no, we need to take a stand. We're not going to be involved in other people's war. We want peace. We want both sides to come to a ceasefire. We don't want war in the world. But asking us to choose between A and B, it's not meeting our interest. And that's one time out of many that we've seen a coordinated response from African leadership. I wish they could do more of this, come to a coordinated response on so many other issues and work as one. Instead of being divided where you have South Africa is within the BRICS saying its own thing, and then you have the other countries joining NATO alliances showing, saying their own thing. You have this one joining China's South Summit saying their own thing. And then they're so disunited. If they could have coordinated response to world issues like they did on this Ukraine-Russia issue, Africa would go a long way. That's why I'm saying that. In terms of this, you know, uh, membership that were not invited, I would think the African Union or the African Union president can even make a statement and say, you know what? We know that these are not democracies, but give these people some time. Give them an opportunity to show what they are able. They are, most of those 
um, military uh, leaders have come up with a timetable where they want to install democracy. Give them time to show what they are able to. The people are also patient with that. I do not think the people of Mali want a military junta for, long, for forever. Neither do the people of Burkina Bay. They do not want that forever. But they are saying if the military leader can come to power and instill some order and instill some civility and bring us leaders and help us vote leaders that represent our aspiration, we will rather give them an opportunity and time to get that done. So I think the United States itself should look in that direction instead of being punitive, instead of having punitive measures. Because we had not long ago that, you know, the United States was warning um, Burkina Faso not to involve itself with Russia. You can't send out that warning one country against the other. You have to work as partners. Show them the carrots and say, we can work, we can be a better partner than Russia. I think we can work, we can do A, B, C better than Russia. Let's work together instead of you working with Russia. Don't dictate and say, you cannot work with Russia. If you work with Russia, this is what's going to happen. That is high-handedness. And that's what Africans do not want anymore, especially the civil society. Because if you look at this conference itself, uh, 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 Laurentia, the United States want African leaders to also have very good ties and relationship with African diaspora because they recognize the potential of African diaspora yes. in helping the African nations come out of some of their problems. So mm. what African diaspora and the civil society is also telling the United States is, as you're trying to help African leaders have good relations with diaspora, also listen to the African diaspora that is saying, do not be heavy handed on African leaders when they want to implement their own democracy on their own terms. Give them time to get this done and done right. That's the message you're sending to them. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah. Now, apparently, uh, the uh, uh, decision not to uh, uh, invite these countries uh, to the summit is out of respect to the African Union because, according to the Assistant Secretary uh, of uh, the United States, uh, Molifi, she says, out of respect for the African Union, we do not invite governments that have been suspended by the African Union of uh, for coups. And uh, she said, however, that the United States would engage with them through other means. What does this really mean? If you are not able to invite somebody uh, to your house uh, for a meeting, uh, how else uh, do you engage with this other person? Uh, does it mean that the uh, African Union has already sidelined these countries that have had coups rather than trying to solve uh, this uh, problem of uh, coups in the country so much so that uh, summit of this magnitude, uh, the United States has to sideline these countries from attending? Lawrence, yeah, let me tell you something. That, those are politically highly coded language, languages. Those, it's highly coded when he hears such statement. In the first place, before African Union sidelined those that carry out coup, who brought the pressure on them? It's the West. Yeah. It's just a coded language. There was so much pressure on the African Union that seems to be a toothless bulldog because you know they don't have their own principle. They don't work on their own principle. They have nothing. They get pressurized to take decisions. So these are co this is just coded language to tell you that we told them not to invite them, and we're just respecting that they respected us by not invite by sending them out of the African Union. That's what it says in real terms. Because to be honest with you, Laurentia, the African Union, the same African Union, and the same France that has pressured the African Union to sanction those dictators is the same France and it's the same Macron who went and installed a military junta. Why would you sanction military juntas in a country A and install another military junta in country B? That's a contradiction. If you want to stand on the principle of democracy, stand on the principle of democracy. When you're sending out mixed messages to the world, condemning dictator in country A and installing another dictator in country B, you are simply telling the whole world that it is your interest that is at heart and not democracy that you are trying to defend. Because you are defending democracy, it should be across the board. There are some of those leaders, we call them sit tight leaders, that have been in power for so long that the United States has condemned. How are they better than those, than those military junctions? How are they better? in terms of hanging to power, 
which is not a representative democracy. I know many people will say, oh yeah, they voted. Voted what? For how long? So, Lorenzo, when you hear those statements, I just want to let you know that those are coded languages. These people, African Union, the reality is that's a toothless bulldog. They get pressurized by Western powers to take those decisions. And when they take those decisions, they now come out and say, we are respecting the decisions of the African Union. But the decision was made from somewhere else and being implemented within the African Union. So, again, give the African leaders that are military junctures time to put their act in order. And if, if they don't put their act in order, the people will still rise up. Remember what happened in Burkina, the Burkina Faso. Damiba was there. And the people rose up and said, you know what? We thought this man was for us, but he's representing the interests of a different country. And they drove him out of power. So it's not that those people just love dictators. It's because the people that were there did not represent their interests, and they were tired of it, and they, took, they, they pushed them out of power. So give those who are there some time to put their house in order, and then you can judge them from there. That's what I can say. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are still uh, we still have a few more minutes to be on the program. So you can always drop a comment on our Facebook page as this program is streaming live on Facebook, uh, or you call our lines. Our numbers on the screen. Tell us what you think about today's topic: uh, the uh, partnership between the United States and Africa. How? far has it gone to benefit the continent ever since its inception in 2014 now that's when the first summit took place up to the up to date what do you think the united states has done for africa or is doing that is beneficial to the continent that warrants this summit to keep holding and what do these african <clears throat> heads of state present during such a summit so that's the question we are asking this day that's what we would like to find out from you is it that this uh, uh, summit is just for the interest uh, of the united states or is it a mutual something uh, is it going to be is it has it been uh, mutually uh, beneficial to uh, uh, both uh, the united states and africa over the years and so that's what we would like to hear from you uh, you can always drop a comment or call us Tell us what you think. Now, carrying on, uh, Mr. Elijah, the, now the United States is also talking, they're going to discuss uh, food insecurity uh, during uh, this uh, summit that will hold for three days in, the, in Washington, uh, D.C. And the United States uh, is uh, struggling to uh, make the world understand that the uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, war has uh, gone a long way to, uh, uh, to, to, to increase the uh, food insecurity in Africa. But I think uh, before this uh, crisis in uh, Russia and Ukraine, Africa has always faced this uh, uh, issue of uh, food insecurity. So why do you think uh, uh, the United States is uh, tr struggling to apportion a blame uh, for food insecurity uh, to the Russia-Ukraine war? When it comes to... Um when it comes to food insecurity in Africa, um, Laurentia and uh, tell viewers, this is not rocket science. This is not rocket science. This is as simple as ABC. I already said from the beginning that Africa possesses 30 between 30 and 35 percent of arable land, world arable land. That's to say, you don't need any manure, you don't need any fertilizer, you don't need anything. You just need to till the ground and plant your crops and they will grow. The West has the machinery, the industrial power, the technology to help Africa become food secure. But here is the thing, politically charged as it may sound, and it is the reality and the truth, the West also has its own interest. They produce a lot of these things that Africa is supposed to produce. So, it is an interest game. What will it take for the United States, Europe, France, to exclusively, five years, implement a rigorous partnership project with African countries that is going to be based solely on agriculture? Mm. What will it take? What it takes, or it fails to take, is that Africa is suddenly going to become a competitor with Ukraine on grains. 
is going to become a competitor with the rest of the world that is producing what Africa is producing, and then they will lose that competitive edge of Africa. I'm telling you the truth. It doesn't take much for the world to help Africa become food secure. It doesn't take much. It takes just coordinated effort and coordinated uh, decisions on the part of whether it is France, it is UK, it is NATO as a whole, United States, and so on. It doesn't take much to see that there is potential in Africa. But what do they do? They come to Africa, what do they do? They produce their aluminum, iron, oil, bauxite, rubber, lithium, the things that are going to help their economies become a superpower. They come and exploit it in Africa. But the things that are going to help Africans, because you do not need a lot of transformation in agricultural products. Like you need a lot of industri industrialization to do any transformation of uh, bauxite, iron ore, uh, aluminum, or whatever it is. You need a lot of technology, a lot of industrialization. Africa does not need any of that in transportation of raw agricultural materials into finished products to compete with the world. Africa does not need much. So they would rather not focus on that. They would do what? They will focus on, oh, let's be partners in in oil, partners in uh, uh, um, aluminum, bauxite, these, because those are the things that are going to help their economy, not African economy. Wake up, Africans. Wake up. Sign partnerships that are going to make you competitive in the world. You're not going to be competitive by just exporting, you know, uh, oil and gas and all this. That is, it's not going to give you a competitive edge. It's not. Work on the sector that you know that you're going to compete the world and dominate the world. If Africa will only dwell on these three things, agriculture, education, and security issues, I'm telling you, Africa will become a gigantic superpower to compete with whosoever, but yet they will not do it. They will not do it. So again, it's a game of interest, Rory. Mm -hmm. It's a game of interest. They do not want Africa to come out of this because if they come out, they're going to compete with them in these issues. That's the truth. There's no conspiracy theory in this. There's no rocket science in this. It's as simple as A, B, C. Why wouldn't they concentrate and help Africa become food secure? This is not something forget, like just like you said. It's not something that just started yesterday because of the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. They're just using that to amplify the issue and say and hide the issue. Africa has been having problems. Drought in Djibouti, drought in, in Eastern African Republic, drought in, 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 um, in the Nile, and all of Eastern Africa. We heard about the Ethiopian crisis back when we were growing up. It's something you can identify, can identify with for years, but yet Ethiopia has wonderful arable land. Why can't those help those countries? Just within the African, within that Sahel zone, uh, mm. if the Sahel can be so food secure, I'm telling you that Africa is going to come out of the doldrum. But what do they do in the Sahel? They go after the bauxite, rob, I mean, uh, those minerals and so on. They exploit everything, decimate the economy, and come back and say, oh, Africa is in food, food insecure. Africa is this. It is a game of interest, Laurentia. That's what's going on. All right, now, uh, before we go, uh, let's uh, look at one more thing that uh, is uh, something that uh, most African states or the continents have seen as a failure on the part uh, of the United States in its partnership with the continent. Uh, we have this policy of uh, AGOA, the Africa uh, Growth and Opportunities Act, uh, which is an American policy that seeks to help uh, sub-Sahara Africa economies grow through relations with the United States. Now, uh, they, they, many people see it as something that has failed woefully and needs to uh, uh, be uh, relooked into. And it is one of those uh, areas of relations Africa will want. Uh, the, to be addressed during uh, this summit. And we also have the uh, Assistant Secretary, uh, uh, Fi Wu, who says uh, that uh, she says we regret that AGOA had uh, trade uh, preferences have not been utilized to the maximum. We think it is important to improve our trade with Africa, so that will be part of the discussion. And it should be noted that uh, this AGOA uh, policy will come to an end in 2025. That's uh, in three years' time. So what explains the fact that the United States has not been 
able to uh, uh, engage in trade uh, in, in the way that Africans would have loved it? What is stopping them? What seems to be the problem? Unfortunately, Laurentia, Agoa is less than 1% of the GDP of Africans. How are you going to trade with close to a 3 trillion economy, African economy, and you can only contribute less than 1% in terms of back and forth trade? Agoa is a colossal failure. The United States have recognized it itself. So what is going on is that they have not laid a lot of interest on Agoa. There are so many trade barriers between the United States and Africa, Africa, which need to be removed for AGOA to even have any semblance of a trade agreement. I know and I recognize, even within Africa itself, that we do have our own issues. You okay. know, even trading between African mm. countries is a big problem by itself. We do recognize that. But the United States, with its gigantic structures, have not really implemented a rigorous structure that is going to see AGOA being forced to the forefront of exchange between African countries and the United States. So much interest has been withdrawn from the, from the African continent into the Ukraine. Do you know how much? I'm not saying this as somebody who is biased. Of course, as an African, I should be biased in some heart. I'm an African, I love my people. But if you know the amount of money that the United States has spent, NATO has spent war equipment, military equipment, intelligence, whatsoever on this war on Ukraine. Compared to what the United States have engaged in when it comes to Agora, it will tell you where their interest is. You know, they say you put your mouth where your money is. You put your mouth where your money is. That is where the problem, the United States has not prioritized Agora. Agora is at the back burner. That is why it, it has registered almost insignificant significant impact on Africa. Very insignificant. And they themselves are recognized. So I am hoping that with the reawakening of this African uh, United States summit, some of these things can be brought back to the forefront mm -hmm. and Africans can discuss it, what has failed, what has not worked, again, as partners not as the master dictated to the other one, working as partners. And I think in that way, Africans will be ready to listen to whoever comes to the table. That's why I said from the beginning, Africans have the opportunity to be the kingmaker. Russia is knocking at the door. China is knocking at the door. The United States is knocking at the door. Welcome everybody. What, have you, what do you have as a plan? You look at everybody's plan and you negotiate based on our own interest. Africans, wake up. That's what our problem is. Even when, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> even when somebody comes to the table, we don't have our own agenda on which we want to discuss with them. Mm -hmm. So they come ready. If you look at the United States agenda for this meeting, they have a seven point plan, mm -hmm. ready to go, ready to impose the agenda, ready to impose the topic of discussion on everybody that is there. If we are on the receiving side of the table, we'll never go far, Laurentia. So Africa should be ready and say, okay, we're opening the door to Russia. We're opening the door to the United States. We're opening the door to China. What have you got? Then you become a kingmaker. Whoever comes with the best plan for Africa, we go along with Russia, of course. United States, of course. China, of course. Every country has its own interests. That should be the platform. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah. Of course, uh, African leaders are listening to us at this point in time. African leaders should be able to push forward uh, their own agenda. They should not only go and sit uh, during such uh, summits, during such conferences, and listen to what the other party has to say. They should be able to put to the table what they want out of uh, such uh, uh, partnerships out of such uh, meetings uh, and it is on that note that we're going to draw the curtains on today's edition oh mr elijah do you have any last words uh, as concerns uh, this partnership between uh, <clears throat> africa and the united states and how uh, they can uh, move forward and this partnership uh, can how it can be beneficial to both sides yes let me just run down this because that's what the united states put forward they said foster economic engagement africans take note what are your economic interests? They say advanced peace, 
security, and good governance. Africa, take note. Good governance in country A, we know what good governance is. But what are the mechanisms of installing that good governance? If it is going to, you know, the type that happened in Libya, be wary of that. Be wary of that. Reinforce commitment to democracy. We are all okay with that. But again, not Western kind of democracy at the expense of the poor people where we are left with war, poverty, and all this. Work collaboratively to strengthen regional and global health security. Good and fine. What is security? Bring to the table what your agenda is. Restore climate change. Ask for your own portion of that climate money. You are not polluting, but the West is polluting. Let them pay for it in Africa. Not only that, amplifying the ties with the diaspora. Africans, please, the diaspora, they are your brothers. They are not your enemies. They might push for a change because they want things better in Africa, but they are not your enemy. You shouldn't wait to come to the United States to be told by Americans that you should reinforce ties with your own diaspora. Reinforce ties with their own people because these people are bringing millions of dollars every single year to the continent. Welcome them back home. Thank you, Laurentia. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Elijah. Thank you so much for honorary uh, invitation. It was a pleasure to have you, and it is always a pleasure to have you on the program to enlighten uh, us, so to enlighten the continent and to enlighten our televiewers more about what is happening on the continent. And of course, today we have been looking at uh, the U.S.-Africa summit, how beneficial it has been to the continent and how it can continue to benefit the continent. Uh, so that has been a point of uh, discussion that that was Mr. Elijah Enoak, who uh, uh, researcher with Leeds University on African Development. Uh, uh, tell you we want to thank all those who took up time to uh, uh, be with us on the program, uh, those who uh, participated in one way or the other. This is a platform where we discuss issues uh, can, uh, pertaining to the continent and how we can seek uh, solutions to these problems, how we can find African solutions to African uh, problems. Of course, another edition of the program comes up uh, on Tuesday, the time at uh, 14 hours uh, GMT. Uh, do join us on Tuesday, 14 hours GMT uh, for another interesting and exciting edition of the program. Uh, but until then, you have a lovely weekend in the company of more of our transmissions. <laughs>